Welcome back to Computer Science 4303. Uh, today we have a bit of an interesting lecture. This is going to be an intro to StarCraft and to BW API, which is the Brood War um, interface for programming StarCraft in C++, as well as sort of a little intro to StarCraft AI and why it's interesting and why we want to do work in this field. So I wanted to make this video because honestly, there's not a really good intro video that sort of explains what StarCraft is. There's a lot of strategic videos, high-level videos, um, even some of Day 9 stuff is really like assumes a lot of knowledge of the game, like you've played it before, you've tried it out, but I wanted to start from very, very um, scratch, which, which is basically you don't know anything about StarCraft, but by the end of the lecture you'll know a little bit about StarCraft. So let me get my laser pointer up here and uh, let's give it a go. I've got a bunch of uh, slides here. So first of all, some useful links. Uh, up at the top here is the Brood War API documentation. And if you are watching this on YouTube, I will link to the PDF version of these slides in the description below. So please go to there to download the presentation um, if you want to do that. Also, if you ever hear me mentioning the chat, I am live streaming this recording on Twitch, so I may be interacting with the chat at some point. So on top here, you see the Brood War API documentation. You can just Google BW API, it will be the first hit. And if you're interested later in programming StarCraft AI, this is where you'll be going for a lot of the API, like which functions do I call and stuff like that. For more of an intro to StarCraft itself, Liquipedia is a very good resource, probably the best resource that's ever existed on StarCraft. Um, just make sure you're going to StarCraft Brood War, because that's what we're going over in this lecture, not the StarCraft II part of it. So here's a bunch of links um, for beginners, uh, all the units and their properties, um, you know, what StarCraft is about, etc. So let's get down to the basics and just talk about what is StarCraft. So StarCraft is a game and uh, it was made by Blizzard in 1998, and it is by far the best-selling RTS series of all time. Um, it has had millions of players worldwide. It has played professionally since 2001. So if you're unfamiliar with, like, eSports, which everyone should know about eSports now, um, StarCraft was really one of the huge pioneers in eSports. Along with um, Counter-Strike, StarCraft was really... Um, I have another lecture on all of this, but it was really one of the first games that was truly played professionally. And professionally, I mean there were teams. Uh, in South Korea, StarCraft was as big as baseball at one point. It was absolutely huge. So, played professionally um, since 2001. It's died off a little bit. Um, StarCraft 2 isn't as popular as it used to be. People have gone in favor of like MOBA games or more popular now than RTS games, but that's all you can do. And if you're interested in actually writing a StarCraft AI bot, um, there's something called the Brood War API, um, which is a C++ API for reading StarCraft memory and issuing commands to the game. So anything you can do in the game as a human, and a little bit more, you can do via programming. Not just C++, um, there are like bots in Python and Scala and Java and all that sort of thing, but uh, Brood War API is what makes that all possible, so that's why I'm mentioning it here. So not everyone is familiar with real-time strategy games. So over here you can see um, sort of a couple of short videos of, of StarCraft being played. So a real-time strategy game is a warlike simulation. You can have single-player games, you can have multiplayer games, you can have one versus one, two versus two, um, eight-man eight free-for-all, um, big game hunters. You can play all sorts of different types of real-time strategy games. Over here, you can see some workers from the Terran race in StarCraft gathering some minerals and bringing it back to their command center. And down here, you can see some Protoss versus Protoss combat going on. So in most RTS games, you start off with uh, sort of this command center or resource depot and a few workers. So what you do is, let me play the video again. You're going to start the game by gathering resources. That resource is, is the most important thing in the game. Without resources, you can't build units. So once you have the resources, you're going to build your town, you're going to build your army, and then you're going to do combat with your enemies, and then there's some winning condition to the game. In StarCraft, the winning condition is destroying all the buildings of your enemy. 
So not all the army units, but all the buildings. And so that can lead to some really interesting scenarios called base races, um, where, for example, you might have your army in the enemy base and they might have their army in your base and you're just trying to kill, kill off the buildings um, as fast as possible. So there's some really um, interesting mechanics in StarCraft, which we'll get into. Um, but first of all, let's talk a little bit about um, strategy in real-time strategy games and in StarCraft in particular. So there's three main categories of overall strategy in real-time strategy games. And I'm sure uh, most of you know what they, what they already are. The first one and the most infamous is probably attacking. So if you've ever heard of something like rushing or uh, zerg rushing or being aggressive, this is an attacking strategy. So an attacking strategy is one um, in which you attack your enemy very early in the game. So you try and catch them off guard. You try and rush them with units as soon as possible. Uh, another type of strategy is defending. So it's the exact opposite of attacking, in which you uh, turtle or you bunker, you build buildings, you build turrets, etc. Um, and the point of a defensive strategy is to fend off an attacking strategy. If you think they're going to attack, you should probably defend. The third um, type of strategy is an expanding type strategy or an economic strategy where what you're going to do is you're going to immediately go for as many workers as possible and possibly build a second base at a second resource location in order to try and get as much income as possible. And what these three main strategies do is they introduce a sort of rock, paper, scissors effect into the strategy space of a real-time strategy game. And this is sometimes called like the, the Trinity, uh, etc. It's really famous, but essentially the rock, paper, scissors, um, you know, rock beats paper, or sorry, paper beats rock, rock beats scissors, scissors beats paper. Well, in this trifecta of strategies, attacking beats expanding, expanding beats defending, and defending beats attacking, right? So what? why is that? Well, if you think about it, expanding beats defending, because if you spent all of your early game resources on defensive units, and I've spent all my early game resources on expanding, expanding my economy, then I'm just going to have way more money than you in the late game. When it comes to defending versus attacking, well, if you spent money on attacking and I spent money on defending, then there's a slight advantage to defenders in that when I create defensive units, they're already in my base. But when you create attacking units, they have to go all the way across the map, possibly find me using scouting. And so there's a home, home base advantage in which defending will beat attacking. And attacking will beat expansion because if you've spent all your early game resources on building a second base or building more workers, then you have no defenses for my attacking. So um, scouting uh, is the process of like sending units to go see your opponent. And that's really important because you've got to know what your opponent is doing in order to respond most effectively. So strategy in StarCraft is all about using information. You can't just pick one strategy and hope that it works in all possible games. You've really got to um, see what your, enemy, what your opponent is doing and respond to that. So StarCraft um, was really a revolutionary RTS game because it was not the first RTS game, but it was the first really balanced, really interesting RTS game. So games that came before it, like Command and Conquer, Warcraft 2, um, they were really what I like to call a symmetric uh, RTS game in which you could play one of two factions. So uh, like Axis or Allies, you could play Orcs or Humans. And really those two, the way they made the game fair and balanced was by just making those two uh, races or factions basically identical with maybe one or two units that were different. So for example, in Warcraft 2, orcs and humans were identical, except the humans had a knight unit that could heal people, and the orcs had an ogre unit that could cast bloodlust. And because bloodlust was so much better than heal, orcs were always chosen. It was very difficult to win with, um, with humans in, in Warcraft 2. But then when Starcraft came around, they said, okay, we're going to take a huge risk, and we're going to make three races that you can choose from, and they're going to be nothing alike. And somehow, through the grace of very smart minds at Blizzard, or maybe sheer dumb luck, depending on who you talk to, um, they made like the most balanced game of all time. So those three races are, are Terran, 
Protoss, and Zerg. And so these are the StarCraft II um, sort of taglines of each of the races. Terran, dominate the battlefield with superior firepower. Protoss, annihilate your enemies with psionic powers and advanced technologies. Zerg, overrun entire planets with the unyielding might of the swarm. Okay, so that's pretty high level descriptions, but let's get into to each race and sort of what they do and the flavor of the strategies that they can, uh, they can give you. So here we have uh, some examples of some Terran units. These are like the, the straight JPEGs that are, or PNGs that I ripped from uh, the StarCraft. Um, MPQ files. So Terrans are human-like race. I'm not sure in the lore if they're actually human. They're called Terran. Um, <clears throat> the Terran race really likes mechanical units, right? So physically, the humans are really weak, and so they get into these suits. Like a Marine here is a, a, a Terran inside a big Marine suit. An SCV is a Terran inside an exoskeleton. A tank is being driven by someone. So they really like mechanical units. One of the unique features about Terran is that their buildings, most of their buildings, can be lifted up and moved and then replaced at another location. Uh, that's something that no other race can do. And some of their buildings can also have add-ons that let you research stuff or build additional units. So some early game units for the Terran are things like the Marine. There's a Marine pictured right here. Uh, Marines have relatively low hit points. Um, they have a ranged attack, and they can hit flying units. And, and they're really good all game. So there's another unit called a Medic that can heal them. And when you're talking about Terran strategies, you'll, also, you'll often see them categorized as Bio or Mech. So Bio means that you rely a lot on uh, Marines and Medics. So Bio meaning that, you know, these are non-mechanical units. And Mech would mean you're making things like Vultures or Goliaths or Tanks um, that are mechanical units um, that can't be healed. And the Marine is a really good early game unit. It's the only first unit in the game that can actually attack flying or attack ranged. So the other races have Zerg Zerglings and Protoss Zealots, and they're both melee units. So, so um, Terran have an advantage, and they start out with an, a, a unit that can attack ranged. Mid-game unit could be something like a Siege Tank. So a Siege Tank um, can walk around, and it can fire and deal a little bit of damage. But once you research the Siege mode... Um, capability they can sort of lock in place and then shoot really really far and so that's sort of a, 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 a race defining unit here is the siege mode for the terrans and in the very very late game they have these huge flying uh spaceships called battle cruisers they're huge ships tons of hit points tons of damage they have a yamato cannon that can fire from far away and do lots of damage so that's sort of the flavor of the terrans they're you know Humans that are going out trying to conquer different worlds, etc. Next we have uh, the Protoss. The Protoss are described as a, a civilized alien race. And they generally, their units are more expensive, but they're also more powerful um, when compared one-to-one -one with Terran or Zerg units. So the unique thing about the Protoss race is that their units have shields that regenerate. So for... Um, the Terran units, they have hit points if you damage them. So, for example, a Marine might start with 40, 45 hit points. I can't remember. If you deal 12 damage to it, then it just has that damage until it might get healed by a Medic. Protoss units have shields. And so you first have to damage all of the shields of the Protoss unit. And then you have to damage the hit points of the Protoss unit. And their hit points do not regenerate, but their shields do regenerate over time. So something maybe like one per second or something like that. Also something unique is that their buildings require power from pylons. So pylons are these units that emit a power field around them, and you can't build any other Protoss buildings except a Nexus without a pylon there first. So that's one of, another one of the unique things. The early game units for the Protoss are the Zealot. It's a tanky melee unit and a Dragoon, which is sort of a tanky ranged unit. So those are the two starting units that, um, well, the, the two first units that you can build with the Protoss. A mid-game unit is uh, the, the High Templar. This is a, 
a caster unit that has mana that you can actually cast spells with. It does AoE damage. It's a really powerful unit if you can control it well. And a late game unit might be something like a carrier, for example. Now, I know I'm talking about early game units, mid game units, late game units. What does that actually mean? Um, well, in, in StarCraft, things are built... Uh, you need prerequisite things in order to build certain things, and I'll get into that later. So when I say early, mid, and late, that means like sort of the level of technology that you've progressed to, but I'll get into that in detail later. So that's the Protoss race. More expensive units. Their units have shields. Uh, pretty, pretty easy race to start with um, if you're thinking about um, building an AI system as well. So the Zerg units, they are sort of this uncivilized alien race. They they play the game by making tons of units and swarming their enemy and, and overwhelming them. Something unique about uh, the Zerg is that their units regenerate hit points over time. So very slowly, but they do regenerate hit points. They also morph all of their units from eggs. So this hatchery unit up here. So unlike, uh, let me go back here for a second because I didn't explain this. Unlike Terran, so Terran, for example, if you make a barracks building, then inside the barracks is where you actually train marine units. Inside the factory is where you actually make tanks, etc. With Protoss, inside the gateway is where you build zealots and dragoons and high templars and stuff like that. So there's actually a building that will be making a unit. And if that building is busy, if it's currently making something, it can't make something else. But the Zerg units, their main hatchery building will actually produce larva over time. So I believe it's every 14 seconds, excuse me, uh, the Zerg hatchery will produce a larva up to a maximum of three. So if you have three larva, it will not produce additional larva um, until you use one of them. So what you do is those, those larva are there, you can click one of them, and then you say make a Zergling, and it will turn into an egg. And once the Zergling is ready to hatch, it will pop out of the egg. So that's a, a unique way that the Zerg uh, train their units. Also, um, they must build their buildings, except for a hatchery, on creep. And I'll show you some creep later and what that means. So the early game units for the Zerg. The, Zerg are prob the Zergling is probably the most recognizable unit um, in StarCraft. It's, you know, the Zergling rush is like this cheesy build that lots of people don't like very much. Um, so they're very fast, um, they're very cheap, they can run really fast, you can upgrade them to attack really fast. They're the typical, like, starship troopers, um, alien type unit. In the middle game, you might have something like a Mutalisk, it's a very fast moving flying unit. Uh, it's very micro heavy, meaning that you can control it really well. Um, you can attack and move, attack and move. Um, I wish I could show you some clips, but I don't really have time during this lecture of, of pro players using Mutalisks. It's really cool. Uh, late game unit could be an Ultralisk or a Devourer. So the Ultralisk is this huge um, unit that costs a ton of money. It deals extra damage to like um, heavy units. It's, uh, it has a ton of hit points. It deals a ton of damage and you can use those at the in the late game. They also have this spell caster called a Devourer um, that can cast this thing called Dark Swarm. Um, which is a spell that goes on the ground in this sort of area and only melee units can attack in that area. So a late game, um, since a lot of Zerg units are melee, like Zerglings and Ultralisks, a really popular late game strategy is to get a bunch of um, Dark Swarm on the ground and then overwhelm your enemy because they don't have many melee units. So what does an example game sort of look like? Um, here's a description. I'm not going to show you a replay. I don't have one. Uh, handy on me, but an example Terran game might go something like this. So in any game of StarCraft, all three races start with a resource depot. So it would be a command center for the Terran, or it would um, be a nexus for the Protoss, or it would be a hatchery for the Zerg. And you're also going to start with four workers, okay? So what you do, an example Terran game, you don't have to follow this strategy, but it's just an example. You start off with four workers, but the first thing you do... Uh, oh, sure, sorry, you're right. Uh, Devourer is a flying unit. I'm thinking of the Defiler. Someone in the chat just um, corrected me. So all of you screaming at your YouTube screen, yes, it is the Defiler. Thank you very much. Um, 
Okay, so you're gonna start off with four workers and you're gonna start off with a resource depot. The first thing you're gonna do pretty much in every game is make more workers. So for example, maybe the Terran will keep making, so they'll make five workers until they have nine workers total. Now, in StarCraft, you have this thing called supply. So you can't just make infinitely many units. So the Terran at the beginning of the game, they're limited to a maximum of 10 supply because the command center that they start with gives you 10 supply. So what you have to do once you start to approach your supply limit is you have to make more supply. And I'll go through, I'll give a, a slight example of this. Um, I'll, I'll launch a game and, and show this um, example. So you're gonna keep making workers until you get to nine. Then you're going to make a supply depot. So a supply depot is going to increase the amount of supply that you can make. Then you're gonna keep making workers until you have 12 workers. And then you're going to make two barracks, maybe, because the barracks can uh, help you produce marines. And then you're going to keep making more marines and more workers and more supply. And then maybe when you have 12 marines, you're going to send them off to attack the enemy. Okay? So that's an example of an early game rushing strategy for the Terrans. So what I just described to you is called a build order. A build order is a sequence of economic actions that you take, sort of making SCVs, making, making buildings, making an army, and it's a list of buildings or units that you want to build in a specific order. And what players do, top level players, is they memorize these sort of chess-like opening books of build orders, and then they adapt them on the fly to, um, to what they see in the game, okay? And if you go online, on Liquipedia, there are tons of build orders that you can have for your bots. However, they're going to be listed like this. So for example, 9 out of 10, Supply Depot, 11 out of 18, Barracks, 13 out of 18, Barracks. And, and this is a bit of a weird thing, but essentially what it means, excuse me, is this, it, they don't want to list like SEV, 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 Barracks, Barracks, Marine, Marine, Marine. And so what they do is they, they list for you at what supply level you should make specific buildings. So this says, when you get to nine out of 10 supply, build a supply depot. And it's implied from that, that you make workers to get to these supply levels. So for example, if we go back to what we just did, this would be, okay, we're gonna keep making workers until we get to nine supply. We don't need to list that. What we're going to say instead is nine supply depot because we've got nine supply and then we build a supply depot. Then we're going to make three more workers. So now we have 12 supply, okay? So this would be 12 barracks, 12 barracks. See how that works? And then so on and so forth. So this is how many, this is sort of, sort of the shorthand form of the opening book build orders that are listed um, on, on websites like Liquipedia. I just wanted to show you how to read those so that, that you can you know how to use them in your bot. So real quick here, what I'm going to do is I'm actually gonna launch StarCraft and I'm gonna show you what that looks like in the game. All right, so here I have StarCraft running in windowed mode. Now, if you're looking at my webcam here, I've, I'm actually gonna be looking at my other monitor, so that's why I'm looking over here. So let me turn down my speakers so I'm not listening to this. Uh, I'm just gonna play a custom game against a default AI just to show you what the interface is like and how to play the game. So I'm gonna go into single player mode. I'm gonna go into the expansion because that lets us use the Brood War units. Um, start, you create a, a name for yourself and I'm going to play custom. I'm going to go sp specify a map. I'm going to choose, oh, I don't know, Andromeda because it's an interesting map. And I'm going to play the Terran race. Okay. Uh, okay. So there's a couple of error messages printed out here, but just ignore those for now because they're related to the StarCraft AI stuff. So here we are, we're playing StarCraft. We start out with four worker units and we start out with a command center. So the first thing I did was select some units and right click on the minerals. And this causes them to sort of gather those minerals and then bring them back. I 
Oops, one second. I'm I'm playing very poorly because I'm trying to explain it as I go. Inside this building, I can train additional workers. Okay, so I'm going to queue up a couple of workers here. One of them is constructing. You can see the progress of that. So I'm going to take these units and continue to, to mine more minerals. And you can see as I keep building them, this is my supply up here. I'm currently at 7 out of 10. You can see my minerals. I have 74 minerals. You can see my gas. I have zero gas. Gas is just another resource. Minerals are the um, basic, uh, the basic resource. So now I'm getting close to nine supply. So what I want to do is when I get to nine supply, I'm going to hit B to build, and then I'm going to hit S to build another supply depot. And so that's going to be built on the map. And if you just look really quick, uh, if I do that again, oh, my, my next guy is ready. So I'm going to build another SCV. When I'm trying to build things, you see this sort of building grid come up. This is telling me if it's green, I can place it there. If it's red, I can't place it there. So I can't build it on other units or on resources or on specific parts of the ground. But I'll be getting into details about that in my slides. So I'm up to 10. I've got my supply depot ready. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to build a barracks. So my barracks is building now. Um, right here. Uh, I'm going to build a couple of more SCVs. Here we go. Now what I'm going to do, oh, my uh, text message just went off. Sorry. One second. All right. So around this time, or maybe even before, you can see how when I pan around the map, there's a certain part of the map that I can actually see, right? This is called the fog of war. So I actually can't see anything on the map until I go and move my units to that location. This is called scouting. So at the very beginning of the game, you have no idea what your opponent is doing and possibly even where your opponent is. So all I know is that this map called Andromeda has four starting locations, okay? Um, so my opponent could be randomly placed at any of those four starting locations. So here is my scouting SCV. They're going up to one of the possible locations. And look, I've found my opponent. So now I can see what they're doing. I can see, okay, they've got a barracks, another barracks. They've got a few Marines. Uh-oh, they're way ahead of me. I've got to start catching up. So I can bring this other scout home. Um, now I can start training some Marines. So you can see that I click on the barracks and I click on a Marine and then it starts training a Marine. All right. Okay. I can also do things like set a rally point. So a rally point means that whenever my Marine is done training, they will automatically go to that location on the map. So see, that's what happens. The Marine comes out and I'm just going to keep making more Marines and I'll make more supply depots, etc. Now, if I hit the V button, there are certain buildings that I can make. So for example, here I can build a factory, but it says I need a hundred gas, but I don't have any gas. So what I need to do to get gas is build a refinery. And so I need to build this refinery and then I can start gathering from, from gas. Uh, by the way, I realize there's a bunch of questions in the chat, but I want to get through this before I get back to that. Once the refinery is done, um, I can send uh, my workers to go gather resources from the refinery. Okay, so you can also see that there are some buildings that I can't build because they require me to have other buildings. So for example, I can't build a factory until I have Sorry, I can't build a starport until I have a factory. I can't build a science facility until I have a, fa uh, a starport. And so there's this sort of list of prerequisites and requirements for buildings, and that's what they call the tech level that you're currently at. So when I was talking about early game, mid game, late game, that's what I mean. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to exit this game. I'm going to forfeit, and I'm going to start a Protoss game real quick. Oops. So let's do the same thing, but we're going to do it with the Protoss race. All right. So I'm going to send my workers off to mine, and then I'm going to build another probe. So let's do that. And I'm going to just do this for like one or two minutes. So someone out there was saying, if you send a scout, aren't you losing a worker? Yes, you may lose that worker because it may get killed by the enemy, 
but it is absolutely critical that you know where your enemy is and and what you're doing okay i'll link to some more advanced strategy um in the game uh in the uh on the liquipedia site there's lots more advanced strategy stuff about scouting etc but for now we're just gonna go with this all right, so I'm up to seven supply, but I'm not doing an optimal build order here. I just want to show you something. So a Protoss gateway is, is how I'm going to train my, my attacking units. But you can see I can't actually place a gateway anywhere. Why is that? Well, it's because one of the defining characteristics of Protoss is they have to build a pylon to supply power to an area um, before they can build a building there. So you can see here my, my worker told a pylon to start warping in, Protoss units, uh, Protoss workers don't have to stay at the building location in order to build the building. It will eventually just be built on its own. Okay, so now that this pylon is done, I can left click it and you can see this area, this blue area around here. That's the powered area. It's called Psi, P-S-I. So now if I want to build a gateway, I can build it inside that powered area. So I'll just go over and show you that. And similarly, just like Terran, um, you know, like they had a barracks that will train Marines. This will train um, my, my Zealot units, which is sort of like the Protoss Zerglings, if you will. I can continue to make uh, more probes. Or what I can do, let's say I wanted to go for a more economic focused game, uh, is I can go down here. Usually, um, maps in StarCraft will have an expansion base where you can go to mine uh, mine more minerals and build a second base. So here, I can build a second nexus with 400 minerals. And you can see I want to build this as close as possible to the refinery and to the minerals. So what I'm going to do is start building it right there. And now once this is finished, if I, if I try and mine this mineral right now, what's going to happen... I can mine it if I want. I could totally send my workers there. But it's going to have to go back to my other nexus in order to bring those minerals back. And that's too far to walk, and it's not very optimal. So what we do is we build another resource depot here. Um, so for the Protoss, that's the nexus, so that we can um, mine minerals from this base as well. Okay, so that's the Protoss race um, and how they start out. And really quickly, I'm going to go... Um, I'm going to quit this, and I'm going to do the same thing with the Zerg just to show you uh, what they do. Okay, same thing, but now I'm Zerg. So I'm going to send my drones out to mine the minerals. And you can see here that the hatchery does not actually make any units, okay? It just, these Zerg larvae pop out from the hatchery. So I can select one of my larvae and tell it to morph into a drone. And so I can select another larva and tell it to morph into a drone. So there's good and bad things about this, right? There's a limited supply of these larvae, but the larva can be built in parallel, un unlike other buildings for other races where you can only um, use a building to build one unit at a time. You can use as many larvae as you want to build things. Also, you don't have to manually click on these larvae. You can click your hatchery, press S to select all of your larvae, and then press D to build drones with all of those larvae. So you can see here, I'm already up to my maximum nine supply that I start with for the Zerg. So what I'm going to do real quick is I'm going to select a larva, which just popped out. And now in order to get more supply, I'm going to build an Overlord. So unlike uh, Protoss and Terran, the Zerg actually start with um, one Overlord, which provides them supply. So the other two races have buildings which provide supply. The Zerg have this floating unit called an Overlord which provides supply. And it can also double as an early game scouting unit if you want to. Just be careful not to lose it. So the next thing I'll do is I'll show you how um, they build buildings. So the first building, kind of like the um, the other unit, the other races. So the Terran had a, had a barracks. The Protoss had a gateway. The Zerg are going to have something called a spawning pool. So a spawning pool doesn't create Zerglings, but it will allow your larva to turn into Zerglings. So you're going to hit S and then build a spawning pool. And you can see here's a really class defining annoying thing about the Zerg is that their builders turn into the buildings. 
So you're actually going to lose a worker every time you build a building, and then you're going to have to build more, um, more, uh, more workers. But now you can also see <laughs> that another annoying thing about the Zerg is that their unit production is tied to how many larvae they have, because I can only build one unit right now, no matter how many spawning pools I have, etc. So what you have to do as the Zerg is pretty early on, you actually have to build a second hatchery because the hatchery produce larva. So you can choose to build that sort of safer, closer to your main base, but what many Zerg will actually do is, is expand pretty quickly because Zerg sort of rely on having more units, etc. So you're gonna wanna have to have, you're gonna want to get a second hatchery pretty quick at some point in the game. And so building a second hatchery is going to allow me to produce more larva to produce more buildings. So, or to produce more units. Okay, so Zerg are a little bit more complicated in my opinion um, to build an AI for because of all this sort of thing, like dealing with the larva, etc. But they're a fun, um, they're a fun race to play and they're very unique. Also, this purple stuff on the ground, this is called creep. And that's the only place that you're allowed to build um, buildings. So for example, if I wanted to build another spawning pool, I can't build it out here. In order to in increase my creep, I have to either build a hatchery, which is super expensive, or I build a creep colony, which will expand the creep for me. So I'm just gonna send out my zerglings to attack and scout. Um, I'm doing this quite late in the game, but it's a tutorial. So here, we're just gonna wait for the creep colony to finish so we can see, um, okay. So now uh, you can see here that the creep is expanding, and so this will expand my territory as the Zerg. Uh, all right, so that's all I really want to show because everything else you can, um, you can sort of get from online tutorials. All right, so we're gonna close down StarCraft now, and we're gonna go back to the PowerPoint, uh, or yeah, okay, so let's go back to the PowerPoint. Perfect. So. Now you've seen sort of how the early game works of StarCraft, how you issue commands. I didn't show any of the attacking, but that's pretty self-explanatory. You, you click a bunch of units and you click what you want to attack, right? So we talked about build orders. I showed you how build orders are sort of implemented in the game and how to read them. But what are some build order problems? So it's not just, okay, here's a perfect build order that works all the time. You've actually got to decide on what type of army do I want to construct? Um, and what type of army I want to construct is actually based on what I see from my enemy and and what I think they're going to do. So if I think my, if I, let's say I started out by building a bunch of Zerglings. If I see my enemy going for flying units, well, my Zerglings can't attack flying units, so now I might have to build Hydralisks, which can attack flying units, right? It's all about scouting and using that information. Where do I want to place my buildings is important. If I have a super important building, like let's say, uh, so the Zerg, they need a spire in order to build mutalisks. That one spire allows me to create all of my mutalisks. So maybe I want to hide it behind my base or in a secret location, etc. It's um, it's really difficult to to <laughs> to to come up with with this sort of strategic play in, a, in an AI system. So what some people have done in the past is they've used things like uh, using human knowledge or machine learning to predict enemy compositions or um, using machine learning to say, figure out where to build your buildings or just hard code it or whatever. Don't worry about that too much. We'll show some, some examples of that later. Okay, so I wanna talk about the Brood War API now because that's what you're going to be using in this course. Um, so the Brood War API is the API, it's a C++ library that's used to talk back and forth to StarCraft so you can write programs that actually play StarCraft. Uh, it injects a DLL into the StarCraft process and then your bot that you write is going to communicate with that DLL. So it, it communicates with your C++ program. When the game starts, Bwapi is going to connect to the game Sorry, Bwapi is going to connect to your bot and they're going to start communicating. Um, it's going to record events and then trigger certain events in your code. And so, um, for example, if you want to know when the game starts, 
uh, I want to do a specific thing, or on each frame of the game, I want to do a specific thing, or whenever a unit dies, I want to do a specific thing. All of these events are triggered for you, and you can use those triggers in Bwapi in order to write your bot. And when the game is over, um, Brood War API disconnects and, um, and everything cleans up. So just for example, you don't need to understand all of this code right now, but here is sort of the main event loop of the Brood War API. So how it works from a C++ point of view is it's going to go through on each frame of the game. So it says, here's the main while loop. It's going to say, while Bwapi is connected to the client and Brood War is in the game, go through each event. And for those events, we're going to do something, okay? So if the event type is um, start of the match, well, what we're going to do is we're going to call our bots on start function. Uh, match frame is the most important one because each frame of the game, you're going to be wanting to build buildings or units or mine minerals or issue commands. And so the vast majority of your bot's code will actually be in this on frame command. And I'll show an example of that in the starter bot later. There's also things like if you want to know who won, well, you could write something um, on end. So the on end function can be triggered um, when the match ends. Also, there's certain things like unit show, unit hide, unit create, unit morph. So for example, whenever a unit is created, we can call our, um, our bots on unit create function. So this is just a little architecture that I've set up in the, in a starter bot that uses Bwapi events in order to trigger specific parts of your code. And then when it's disconnected, you can break out of the main loop or whatever. So this is sort of like, you don't really need to, to understand that too much, but that's how Bwepi works under the hood. Um, the way it truly works is by actually like reading all the individual bits and stuff of StarCraft, but all those details are completely hidden from you and you get a nice um, C++ interface. What I've done for you um, is I've actually written a GitHub repo called StartCraft, and it has a starter bot for C++ um, and Brood War API. It is extremely easy to set up. Uh, it takes about three minutes. You essentially just have to download the repo and download StarCraft. So I have actually included a download of StarCraft Brood War 1.16. I've been given permission by Blizzard to host that um, because I run the StarCraft AI competition. So you clone the repo, you follow three steps, and actually let me show you those steps right now. So if I just uh, exit out of this and I'm going to open up the StarCraft repo. So I'm going to back to the middle monitor here. Here is the repo. It's just github.com slash Churchill slash StarCraft. And here are the instructions. Download or clone this repo. Download and unzip this link, which is StarCraft Brood War, run a batch file. That's all you have to do in order to run the starter bot. And then if you want to program in C++ for the bot, you just have to install Visual Studio 2019, open up the solution file, and write code. That's it. So StartCraft, um, last class, I gave instructions on how to um, set up and install UAlberta bot, which is a more... Um, fully featured StarCraft bot that you can use um, if you want. However, the quickest way to get started is just by using StarCraft. If you do want to use uh, a more fully featured bot, if I go to UAlberta bot, if I Google that, you get the first link is the GitHub repo. Uh, if you want to start with like a fully featured StarCraft AI bot, you can go to the wiki here, click on installation instructions, and you can follow these installation instructions, which are much more involved. But um, at this point, you if you're working with UAlberta bot, you're probably a more involved developer. So these instructions are pretty easy to follow. They're just very, very detailed. So that's Star StartCraft, and you can use it to make your first bot if you want to. I will be going into, I'll be looking at some code for StartCraft at the end of this video. Um, so I'll, I'll have timestamps um, in the video if you want to skip to the StartCraft section. But I'm going to go back into explaining more about StarCraft and how StarCraft and Bwapi interact. All right, so let's go back to the PowerPoint. All right, StarCraft unit commands. Um, so you saw when I was playing the game there that I was issuing commands to the units. Um, each unit can be given various different commands. 
Uh, you cannot control enemy units. So if you click one of your own units, there's a menu that shows you what command, excuse me, what commands you can issue. If you click on an enemy unit, that menu isn't there. Obviously, you shouldn't be able to control your enemy units. So just some example, you can tell your units to, uh, to move, to attack, to patrol, to build, to stop, etc. Um, those unit commands are going to take parameters. So when you're um, clicking them in the game, then where you click is the parameter, right? So if I click my Zergling, and then I click attack, and then I click an enemy unit, it's going to attack that enemy unit. Um, also, what I could do is I could click my worker and right click on the map, and that's gonna tell it to move somewhere. So the position where I clicked is the, is the parameter of where to move, but when you're programming it, you've actually got to specify a position. When you're attacking, you've got to specify a unit that you want to attack. When you're building, you've got to specify a type that you want to build and a position. So let's just look at a couple of examples, um, high level BWAPI programming examples. Okay, so if you want to um, see a list of all the different commands that you can send to a unit, you can go to this link here, which is the, the BWAPI unit interface um, API website, sorry, documentation. That's what I wanted to say. Okay, so I've just created a function here which is going to take in a unit. So this is actual Brood War API code now, and you can see how easy it is to going uh, to be able to use it. The main uh, unit class is the Bwapi unit class. Okay, so Bwapi is the namespace, unit is the class type. So under the hood, a unit is actually a pointer. Uh, it doesn't look like it here because we're not passing in a pointer, but under the hood, a unit is actually a pointer. So we're going to use the arrow instead of the dot whenever we issue functions on a unit. So let's say that I want my unit to go onto the map at a particular position in the map. And we'll talk later about how StarCraft handles it positions. So we have a Bwapi position object. Let's call that desired position. That's going to be 400 pixels in the X direction and 300 pixels in the Y direction. And then I can just say unit move desired position. That's it. And then your unit in the game will stop what it's doing. All other commands will be canceled and it will move just as if you had selected that unit and right clicked it in the map. Also, what you can do is so in the game, you can click move and then you can click. So there's two ways to move. There's two ways to do most things. Uh, you can click your unit, then you can click the move button with the left click and then you can left click where you want to move to or the shortcut is to left click your unit to select it and then right click on the map where you wanna go. So in Bwapi, you can do both of those things as well. You can tell it to move to a desired position or you can right click a desired position and it's going to infer whether it has to move or attack or whatever depending on the arguments of right click. So for example, if I have one of my Zerglings and I tell it to right click another enemy unit it's going to attack that enemy unit because that's what right clicking does in the game. Uh, there's another command called attack move. So in the game, if I click a unit and then I click attack and then I click somewhere in the level on the ground, not clicking an enemy unit, what's going to happen is it's going to attack move to that position. And what attack move does is that if there are no enemies on the way to that position, it's just like move, okay? So it'll it'll go toward that position and stop when it gets there. But attack move, if it sees any enemy units on the way there, it will divert to attack them. If you say move, it won't divert to attack. If you say attack move, it will divert to attack. You could also tell it to patrol to that desired position. What patrolling does is wherever your unit is right now, call that position A. If you tell it to patrol to position B, then it will walk toward position B, and when it gets there, it will come back to position A, and it will oscillate back and forth between A and B. So that's a patrolling behavior. So let's say now I want to do something to an enemy unit. So I'm gonna write a function that says get enemy uh, unit target, that is up to you, however you want to target a unit, but we're just going to get an enemy unit to target. So we're going to tell our unit to attack the enemy unit. That's something we can do. Uh, we can also right click the enemy unit and that will also attack the unit. We can also issue some specific commands. Like for example, if a Zerg unit has the burrowing uh, research uh, completed, then you can tell a unit to burrow. 
you can tell a unit to stop. So if it's moving, you can just tell it to stop and it won't go any further. So this is the very simple way that you're going to interact with the Brood War API in your C++ program. Very, very simple. All right. Now that you've seen like sort of how you're going to issue commands, now you want to talk about StarCraft unit properties. So each unit in the game has a number of properties. Um, the unit instant properties are going to be on the Bwapi unit class. So once I have a unit, I can query the properties of that unit. Um, so what I mean here uh, by... So there's a difference between unit instance properties and unit type properties. So a Bwapi unit, so an actual unit in the game is an instance of a unit. So for example, I can have a unit that has ID seven, that's a Marine. That Marine will have a specific position on the map. It will have a specific amount of hit points that it has right now. It will belong to a specific player. That unit will also have a unit type, right? So for example, Let's say I have two different Marines. So I have a Marine on the left side of my screen. I have a Marine on the right side of my screen. Those are two unit instances of two Marines. Both of those instances, they may have different positions. They may have different healths. They may have different shields, but they have the same unit type. So unit instances have properties, but unit types also have properties, right? So... This is the Bwapi unit type. So Marine is a unit type. SCV is a unit type. Zergling is a unit type. And all of these type properties are the same for each unit with the same type. So for example, the maximum health of a Zergling is the same for all Zergling instances. The damage of a Marine is the same. The acceleration, the size, the, the mineral price, the supply, etc. All of those are properties of a unit type and unit instances have a given unit type, okay? So I hope that's clear. Um, and unit types have all sorts of different properties. So for example, uh, if we're looking at uh, Protoss units, um, probes are small size, they, they require one supply, um, they cost 50 minerals and zero gas, they have 20 hit points and 20 shields, and so all the different unit properties I've included here in this, um, in this file. StarCraft unit sizes. Each unit is a different size in the game. StarCraft unit sizes are measured in pixels and they move in pixels. So you can move some units to the left by one pixel if you want to. So for example here, a Hydralisk is 21 by 23 pixels. A Ghost is 15 by 22 pixels. An Ultralisk is 38 by 32 pixels. So if you want to see all the units and their unit sizes, there's a link there. Um, and all the different unit types in the game and their buildings um, also have uh, various properties. Um, I forget what these properties are. I think these are like the bounding box sizes of all the different units or something like that. But they're all listed here on Liquipedia. Okay. So some important classes in um, Brood War API that you're going to need to know about are the following. So here's the StarCraft unit structure. Um, you're going to use it to access all unit instance info. Okay. So that's the Bwapi unit. And I just set it equal to null pointer because under the hood, um, it's it's a, a pointer to a unit that lives in Wappy somewhere. Um, then there's the unit type. So for example, in order to get a unit's type, like, oh, what type is that unit? Is it, is it a Marine? Is it uh, a probe? Is it a Nexus? We're going to say unit get type. Okay. Now I know I'm calling it on a null pointer here, but just pretend that it was it was actual something. So this is the StarCraft game instance object. So the Bwapi Brood War, if you called Bwapi Brood War, that is how you get all the information about the current game that's playing, okay? So this is an instance of the Bwapi game class, and you can say, hey, Bwapi Brood War, get frame count, and it will display or it will return the current frame of the game. You could say Bwapi Brood War, resign game. You could say Bwapi Brood War, um, get all units or something like that. This is the main instance object, and you'll be sick of typing Bwapi Brood War by the end of the project. 
Um, here is a player object. So a Bwapi player is either going to be me or it's going to be the enemy. In this class, we're not going to talk about multi-multiplayer StarCraft. So there's going to be one of you and one of the enemy. So if I want to get a reference to... So Bwapi player is also a pointer. So if I want to get a pointer to me, the player, um, I can say Bwapi Brood War self, and that will return my player object. And then if I want to see how many minerals I have, I can say me get minerals, me get gas, something like that. Also, uh, here's a, there's a position object in BWAPI. So we just called unit get position and we store that in a Bwapi position. And so these are the, I would say the five biggest classes in the game. You've got units, unit types, you've got the game object, Bwapi Brood War, you've got a player object, and you've got a position object. So those are the ones you're going to be dealing with the most. Here's some examples of how you would actually use Brood War API to say, look through units. For example, I, I told you how to act on units once you have a unit, but actually, how do we get the unit that we want to actually control? So here's just a function that uh, a function called unit examples. And so what we're going to do is we're going to say for auto unit. So I, and just instead of typing Bwapi unit here, I typed auto. So for auto unit in Brood War get all units. So what this is going to do is it's going to loop over every visible unit in the game. So if you call Bwapi Brood War get all units, what that does is any unit you can see, it will return a reference to. So if there are hidden enemy units within the fog of war, you will not get them when you call this function. Okay, you'll get your units and any enemy units that you can see. So let's say we want to get the position of that unit. So we can just say Bwapi position P equals unit get position. Uh, let's say we want to get the player of that unit. So we can say who controls that player, right? So I can say Bwapi player PL equals unit get player. Uh, someone asked, can see on screen or just not in fog of war? That's a good point. So as a human player, you can only see what's on your screen, okay? This Bwapi Brood War get all units returns any unit on the map which is within vision of any of your units. It is not limited to the current screen that you're viewing, okay? So the Brood War API is a bit superhuman in that it can see the whole map. Now, it, it doesn't have cheat codes on, okay? Uh, you can turn cheat codes on if you want to, but it can see anything that any of your units are around. All right, it, it's not limited to just the, the screen vision. That was a good question, thank you. Uh, so let's say, for example, I want to, to tell whether or not a given unit belongs to me. Well, what I can do is once I get the player of a unit, I can check to see if that player is equal to myself. So, bool my unit equals PL equals Bwapi Brood War Self. That's how I would tell whether or not I own this unit. Um, the current hit points of a unit, I can get that um, by saying unit get hit points. And the type of a unit, um, I could store that if I want to by saying unit get type. And then let's say I want to know how much damage that unit can do in one attack. I can say, okay, well, that unit type is going to have specific properties. Well, one of those properties is the ground weapon of, of the unit. So I can say t.groundweapon, and that will give me a an instant, or sorry, it will return the weapon type of the ground weapon. And then I can call damage amount on that weapon type. So this is how I would tell how much damage this unit can deal to ground units. Whether or not... Uh, I want to know if the unit is a worker or it's not a worker. Well, I can just call the unit type dot is worker. Is it a drone? Oh, oops. <laughs> I made a mistake here on this slide. Let me edit it. It's supposed to be is probe. All right, let me go back down. Here we go. So whether or not it's a worker, you can tell, but you can also tell whether or not it's a specific unit type. 
So there's a namespace in Bwapi called Bwapi unit types. And if you type Bwapi colon colon unit types colon colon, if you have IntelliSense on, then you will see a list of all the different units. They're all hard coded there for you. And so I can tell if it's a probe specifically by checking to see if the pipe the type is equal to the probe type. Or I could check to see if it's a nexus or a command center or a marine or a defiler or whatever using that, okay? So Bwapi unit acts like a pointer, remember, so I don't need to return references here. You can copy units all day and it's very, very efficient. All right, so how do, would we start making a starter bot then? Well, we're going to start, the, the most important thing is gathering resources, right? So we're going to need to make our bot look like it's doing this somehow to gather resources. So in order to build units, you first need to gather resources for your workers. That is super easy to do for a human, right? Because we just select our workers, we right click a mineral. We have this amazing brain that does it all for us. But how the hell do we do that with a bot? Well, what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to be able to do things like find the closest mineral and then find a worker who isn't doing something else right now, and then send the worker to mine from the mineral. So let's see how we might write that if we were doing it in code, okay? So here is some code that is going to send all of your idle workers to go gather minerals. And an idle worker in StarCraft is one who's just standing there not doing anything. Okay. Um, someone asked, what happens with race conditions if you are looping over those units getting properties when it dies? Um, if it is dead, it will no longer be a unit pointer. So you are getting this information on one frame of the game. And so on one frame of the game, the unit is going to be alive, right? And it's going to be a valid unit pointer and it's going to have greater than zero hit points. And on the next frame, when you query all the units, if that unit is dead, it just won't be there anymore. Okay, so there are no race conditions whatsoever. It's a blocking frame by frame um, system. So yeah, I should have mentioned this at the beginning, but each frame of the game, um, StarCraft and Bwapi will wait for all of your code to complete before going to the next frame of the game. So if your code takes a minute to run, the next frame of the game will not appear and the game will stop playing for that full minute. So it's a completely blocking system in that regard. All right, so back to the task at hand. We're going to write a function which is going to send all of our idle workers to gather minerals. So an idle worker is someone who's not building, they're not moving, they're not attacking, they're just sitting there doing nothing. So your four starting workers will be idle at the beginning uh, of the game. So here's a function, it's called gather minerals. We are going to iterate over all of the units that we control. And so I can say for each unit in Bwapi Brood War self get units. So the player pointer stores a vector of units that it controls. So this is very convenient. We can just iterate over all of our units at any time. And so here, what I can do is I can say, if this is not a worker, continue, okay? So what I could have done here is say, if it's a worker, then do some stuff. But because the slides are limited in space, I'd rather just eliminate non-workers, okay? So if it's not a worker, right? So if not unit, get the type of the unit. If that type is a worker, not it, continue, right? So if it's not a worker, just skip it. We're not gonna send non-workers to go gather minerals. Then I can say, well, if the unit is not idle, I don't want to bother it, so continue, right? Otherwise, let's select a mineral on the map. So I'm going to write a function called get closest mineral, and that's going to take in the unit as a parameter. So what this is going to say is this is a function which takes in a unit and looks through all the units in the map, and it's going to return the mineral that's closest to that unit on the map. Then I'm going to take that unit and right click that mineral. Done. That's it. That's the function which takes all of our idle workers and sends it to go mine minerals. Super easy. Not everything will be this easy, um, but that's this easy. So the unit will continue to mine until it is interrupted. Now, I had that function, which is get closest mineral, right? Let's go through that as another example. So what this function is going to do is I'm gonna pass in one of my units and I'm just going to return 
the closest unit, which is a mineral, to my unit. Okay. So, I'm going to store a unit instance, which is going to store the closest mineral to my unit that I've found so far. So initially that's gonna be null, right? Because it's gonna be null because I haven't found anything yet. And the minimum distance I'm going to store as the highest possible integer, right? Because I'm gonna recording the distance of each mineral patch to my worker and then storing the minimum one. So I'm gonna store the minimum distance and I'm gonna store the worker, the, the, the mineral, which is the closest. So you can go through all the neutral units on the map. And the neutral units are the ones which are not controlled by a player. So a mineral or a Vespine geyser is a unit just like any other, but it's a neutral unit. So if I want to make my code a bit faster, I could have looped over all units here, but I'm just gonna uh, loop over all the neutral units. Oh geez, excuse me. So I'm going to say, um, if this, so I'm gonna record the distance. So unit get distance my unit. So units and positions come with a function already called get distance. That's going to return the integer distance in pixels from one position or one unit to another. So that's already built in for us. And this is gonna say if distance less than min distance, so if this distance is closer than anything else that I've had so far, um, I'm gonna record the minimum distance and I'm gonna record the closest mineral. And then I'm gonna return the closest mineral. Who can tell me what's wrong with this code? Because I made a mistake here and no, I'm not talking about the missing semicolon, but who can tell me what's wrong? What did I not do in that code? Someone said it will walk into minerals that are out of vision. That's possible. But in practice, it's going to select the closest mineral and we start right next to the minerals, right? So it's going to send our workers like to the minerals that are in our base. So in practice, that probably won't happen. The, the thing that's bad here is that I haven't filtered out minerals right so what i actually have to do here is if i go back i'm just going to look at my middle monitor um i'm not going to put this in the slide just yet i have to test to see if the unit is actually a mineral which i didn't do right i didn't do that so i have to check if the unit type is a mineral and it's somewhere in the in the unit type commands. But what like here, I could have selected a Vespine geyser. I could have selected a sheep on the map or something else. So just make sure that you do that. All right, so I'm going to undo this and I'll fix that slide later. Okie dokie. So let's keep moving on because I, I got a bunch of stuff that I still want to go through. This lecture is going a bit long, but uh, that's fine. It'll be one nice uh, YouTube video. Um, that has all the information in it and I'll have timestamps everywhere so you can click around. So let's go back to a build order for a second. Um, oh, I've got some slides duplicated here. So just give me a sec. I'm going to delete these. I have already gone over those. All right. So when you're building units, you have to be careful that you build the correct army composition, right? So we talked about build orders before and like sequences of economic actions. Just be aware that selecting what units to build is a bit of a tough problem. And your army composition is going to be an important choice. Like here, for example, you know, you've got Zerglings and Ultralisks versus tanks, which is a very typical late game Terran versus Zerg scenario. And so they had to choose at some point what units they wanted to make. Now, when deciding on your army composition, a very important point is the StarCraft tech tree. So each building and unit in the game has a set of things that are required to build first. So for example, I can't build a Marine until I have a barracks. I can't build a factory unless I have a barracks. Um, I showed a couple of examples of those before. These requirements are called tech. And if you list out the tree of prerequisites, that's called the tech tree. So that's why this is called that. Here is an example of the Protoss tech tree. 
So if we look over here, um, you can build a Protoss pylon, nexus, or assimilator whenever you want at the start of the game. There are no requirements. However, you're going to have to have a forge in order to build a nexus, right? You're going to, have, sorry, you're going to have, uh, these, these go from top down. So you need a nexus in order to build a forge. You need a nexus in order to build a gateway. You need a gateway in order to build a shield battery. You need a gateway to build a cybernetics core. You need to build a cybernetics core in order to build a stargate, for example. So let's say that we're trying to come up with a build order, right? And so I want to be able to build a carrier. So I want to build carriers. If you look over here um, on the right-hand side of the screen, a carrier requires me to have a fleet beacon, all right? So the series of steps that I need to go through in order to build a carrier is I need a nexus, then I need a gateway, then I need a cybernetics core, then I need a stargate, and I need a fleet beacon, all right? So that is the tech tree. It is there for all unit types in the game, and it is there for all um, buildings in the game as well. Terran have a bit of an extra annoyance in that buildings can have add-ons and Zerg have a tech tree as well. So just be aware that that tech tree matters and you can query in the unit type, for example, um, what is required to build something or uh, what is the type of unit that builds this thing. All of that information is there in the Brood War API for you. Okie doke. Now let's talk a little bit about the StarCraft map, okay? So, when people say that StarCraft is a balanced game, what they really mean is that maps, good maps for StarCraft are balanced or not. So what the hell do you mean by that, Dave? I thought the game was balanced. Well, it turns out that the environment in which you play the RTS game, the map that you play on, is just as important as the properties of the game itself. Let me move this down here because I'm going to be showing this off. So for example, the game might be balanced on like the pro level maps that are used in tournaments, but if you start two bases right next to each other, right, it's very probable that Zerg will win because Zerg can attack faster or whatever. So the properties of a map are very, very important um, when discussing balance, strategy, etc. And also, especially when you're programming in Brood War API. So a StarCraft map looks like this. This is a high level view of a StarCraft map. You can see a couple of bases here. Well, what that is, these are starting locations on the map. So I forget the name of this map, but uh, this map is a four player map, okay? That means that there are four possible starting locations on the map. Let me, yeah, I'll, yeah, I'll move this down here. So there's four possible starting locations on the map. What does that mean? Well, when you start a game, StarCraft is going to randomly assign you and each of your enemies to one of the possible starting locations, okay? It's going to give you your starting building and your four workers and then say go. Uh, so for example, if there's a one versus one game, maybe you start up here and your opponent starts here, or you start here and your opponent starts here. So that's how a game starts. It randomly assigns you to one of the locations on the map. Those are called starting locations. And Brood War, uh, Bwappy Brood War, the game object, you can query all the starting locations and it will give you the starting locations of any given map. All right, so those are the red boxes. The blue boxes are what is called a choke point. So a choke point in StarCraft is a small area of the map that lets you essentially get in and out of a base, usually. So a choke point is like a funnel so the, the game map is really wide open. You can go wherever you want. But the way maps are designed typically is that a base is surrounded by some sort of wall or cliff that you can't get through, okay? And the in order to get into the base to scout or to attack, there's usually a little gate or a choke point that you have to go through. So these blue boxes are called choke points and well-balanced maps usually have some sort of choke point. All right, the green boxes here are what I'm calling expansions. So expansions are where you would build your second base, usually. 
And these, uh, what I've circled here green, or in StarCraft terminology, are called natural expansions. So they are the expansions which are closest to the starting locations. So for example here, um, this player, in order to build their first expansion, they would walk down through the choke point and then build a second nexus right here in their natural expansion. It's possible sometimes that you would want to build an expansion somewhere else if you were being sneaky or you wanted to hide it, but usually you're going to build your first expansion at, um, at, the, at the natural expansion. Also, you can have what are called islands. So this particular map has two island bases, and they're called island bases because you are not capable of walking on the ground to those locations from your start location. So typically, all the bases are reachable from each other via ground. So if I take my scouting unit, my initial worker, I can scout any location on the map. However, you cannot get to the island bases unless you build a flying transport unit um, that can take you there. All right, so let me put myself back up there because I'm covering up island. But this is just some of the terminology that you're going to see when it comes to StarCraft maps. And like, here is um, the start locations, choke points, expansions, islands, etc. That's what they are. So when I demoed um, the StarCraft game, you saw that there was this thing called the fog of war. Okay, so you start only being able to see, you can only ever see what your units are around. So what happens is, let's say uh, you're, if you have your enemy base selected, it's going to be completely black. You can't see anything. Then what you might do is send a worker to scout, and while your worker is in their base, you can see around your worker. However, if your worker dies, or if you pull your worker away, what you're left with is sort of this cloudy vision of what used to be there. So if you scout an area of the map, like your opponent's base, and then you leave, what you see are the buildings that were there when you scouted. That doesn't mean, this will not update as time goes on, it's just there as kind of a reminder or a snapshot of what was there when you last saw it. So StarCraft um, does have imperfect information, right? So for example here, um, there can be invisible units as well. So this imperfect information in a game theory sense uh, we know from our prerequisite course that that means that one player has information that the other player doesn't. So for example here, we see um, some Zerg units which are burrowed under the ground. These are called Lurkers, and they have a spine AoE attack that goes out in a line and hits everything in a line. These Terran mar Marines can't see them because they don't have vision of these invisible units. Later on, if they if they scan it, or if they get a, a science vessel that can see invisible, they can. But for right now, they're just walking up this ramp into their doom because they don't know that these units are there. Okie dokie. So here's uh, some more examples of what we just saw. Here's an example of uh, the starting state of the game of StarCraft. So I've got my base. This is on the map destination. And I've got my four initial workers, which are really hard to see. And I've got my command center, but I just or, or my nexus. I just wanted to show you what your base is going to look like sort of as the game progresses and you expand outwards. So when you start here, here is your main base perimeter. So the map was designed with these cliffs that make it so ground units can't enter your base except through the choke point, okay? Um, there's no real good place for me to put, oh, there we go. We're gonna put myself up here. So you've got your main base which is surrounded by a perimeter. And then your base is also going to have a choke point, which allows units to come in and out of that choke point. Then as the game goes on, you've got your natural expansion right here. And on this particular map, uh, there are also choke points for the natural expansion. Okay, so that's what a base will look like. And here's how you sort of, as a human player, analyze a base and say, okay, here's my main base, here's the perimeter, here's the choke point, maybe I want to put some turrets up there or some cannons, then I'm going to expand there and maybe put some cannons at the uh, choke point for there. All right, so here's a Protoss base at the start of the game, 
And here's what a Protoss base might look like um, after your first expansion and maybe in the middle of the game. Okay, so we've got uh, some gateways and a citadel of Adun up here, and we've got some pylons, and then we've got a, an expansion with more workers, etc. So that that's sort of how it looks after we've expanded. Uh, here's the Zerg at the start of the game, at the opposite end of this map. So they've got some creep, they've got their uh, hatchery, they've got some workers. And here's building. They started building another hatchery at the expansion. Here's the Zerg base after their first expansion is done. They're currently building a refinery out here. And then maybe um, here's the Zerg base after their second expansion, right? So they've got another one up here. And then later on, after the Zerg die, the game is over and they no longer have any bases left. So, so that's how the, um, the, the game sort of progresses and how you're analyzing the terrain of the map and making strategic decisions. Okay. Now, if we take this, let me move back over and we want to apply this, um, especially when we're AI programming, we've got to know the details of the StarCraft position system, which is handled by a grid. So StarCraft maps work on a grid system. Different types of grids, each with their own level of precision and their own type of task that they perform. So maps are drawn in game with textures that are applied to the underlying grid. Right? So you've got sort of tiles and then textures are drawn on those tiles at the grid level. The grid is not visible in the game, but all of the logic in the game operates on the grid system. So we covered this a little bit in one of the previous lectures, but I'm going to go it over again. Okay. Someone asked, uh, why, are they, uh, why are the lurkers being shown? Okay, let me go back real quick. Do, 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 do. All right. Why are those lurkers being shown? Because this is from the point of view of a replay file where you can see every unit on the map. So those lurkers would not, those holes would not appear to the Marines. Only their spines would appear to the Marines. That's a good question. But yeah, that this is being shown from the point of view of God who can see everything. So let's go back. All right. Starcraft grids. Now, over here, I've got an example of a grid, and there's three different types of grids that operate within StarCraft. So the first grid here is not really a grid. It's essentially just every pixel in the game. So StarCraft Brood War operates um, at a pixel level when it comes to unit bounding boxes and unit movement, okay? So units can move at a pixel level, and they also have bounding boxes which have sizes defined at the resolution of one pixel. So here we can see these red boxes that define the unit bounding boxes. They are not the same as the unit sprite. You can see here that the tank's bounding box, where it collides with other units, is much smaller than the unit sprite. But that is the pixel level precision. In, the, in Brood War API, if you want to define uh, a pixel level position, you would use Bwapi position, okay? So Bwapi position is, is what you'll use most often when dealing with units, and that is at the pixel level. Next is the most uncommonly used um, tile, but you can see here that there is a gray area. So this is called the walk tile grid. The walk tile is an area which is eight pixels by eight pixels, okay? And so in StarCraft maps, it contains a walkability Boolean grid, essentially. So each of these gray cells here, um, the game stores whether or not a unit can walk on that tile or not. Um, units cannot overlap false tiles. Uh, Okay, so for example, if you, uh, sorry about that, Some, I just had the mailman at the door, they pinged my, my nest cam. So let's say you had one of these tiles on top of water, you cannot um, walk on top of water, so that walk tile would be false. Um, and inside WAPI, you can query whether or not specific tiles are walkable or not 
by Bwapi walk position. So there's a Bwapi position, there's also a Bwapi walk position. I can tell you that in, in 50,000 lines of writing StarCraft AI code, I have used Bwapi walk position once. So it's very rarely used. I just wanted to tell you how it's used by the game. Okay. One of the more commonly used ones is called the build tile. So a build tile, remember when I was uh, playing the game and I showed you uh, like trying to place a building and there were big red squares and big green squares? That is the build tile resolution. So uh, it's 32 by 32 pixels. So if you can see here, um, the green tiles are four by four walk tiles because they're 32 by 32 and the walk tiles are eight by eight. So build tiles are 32 by 32 pixels. Um, buildings can be placed um, in a width by height rectangle. I'll show you an example of that in a second. And you cannot place a building on any tile where any of its included walk tiles are not walkable. So if within this four by four grid, any one of these walkable tiles is false, you cannot build on it. So that's all handled for you. Bwapi handles that. And in Brood War API, this is the Bwapi tile position. Okay, so if I have a Bwapi tile position of 2, 2, the conversion to a Bwapi position would be to multiply the X and Y coordinates by 32. So the top left corner of the build tile 2, 2 would be at Bwapi position at a pixel level of 64, 64. So that's how that works. So in StarCraft, uh, internally, there's this building grid there's a walkability grid, and there's a pixel level grid as well, okay? So just as a sort of sum up in one, um, in one slide, the green is the build tile, the gray is the walk tile, and the red is the pixel level unit bounding boxes. Okie doke. This is what happened in StarCraft. We have this buildability grid, if you want to. So this operates at the tile level. You don't actually get to see the grid, but um, these here are 32 by 32 pixel areas, which define whether or not I can place a building. Now you see me here trying to build a command center on what appears to be solid ground. So why can't I build it there? Why is this area red? Well, there's actually a rule in StarCraft that says specifically you cannot build a resource depot within three build tiles of any resource. And so this is within three build tiles of um, a, uh, a Vespine geyser, so you can't build it there. You would have to build it further away. In StarCraft 2, the cool thing is you do get to see the buildable grid. It actually shows you a grid and it shows you the reds and the yellows and stuff like that. So that's cool. And here's just a really quick video from StarCraft 2 because it's a bit nicer of how you can wall off a choke point, okay, using this grid. So you can sort of fill up an area so that units from the enemy could not pass through by using this grid to your advantage when you're trying to build things, okay? So that's how that works. Alrighty. So... What I just want to show you now is visualizing these grids on an actual StarCraft map and what it would look like. So let's take this map and we're going to convert it into a grid view. So I'll take this map and convert it. Oh, come on, PowerPoint. Convert it to a grid view. Okay. So this isn't exact, but it's pretty good. We're going to convert it into the tile. So the 32 by 32 pixel build tile view. So you can see here, uh, here's some like walls, here's some water, here's some minerals, here's some Vespine gas, um, here's a building, etc. Okay, so here is that converted into uh, a tile view so you can get a feel for how uh, it works. You can see here that I've actually displayed the 8x8 eight eight pixel walk tiles as well. So here's the legend for this. Um, Anything that's dark is not walkable, okay? So that means we can't walk on it, and by definition, if we can't walk on it, we can't build on it. So all of these black areas here, we cannot build or walk on those areas. If it's gray, that means that we can walk on it, but we can't build anything there. So you can see here that uh, it's a bit small, 
but a couple of pixels of this gray tile are black. So what that means is that in StarCraft, you cannot build on any build tile which contains an unwalkable walk tile. Excuse me, I gotta sneeze. Okay. So, because this tile contains um, walk tiles which are not walkable, I have marked it gray, which means you can't walk there. All right. If it's yellow, that means you can walk there, but you can't build there. So there are certain walkable areas that you can't build on. Namely, if you look here, this is a ramp and this is a bridge. You can't build on ramps or bridges. So that's why these are colored yellow. You can walk there, but you can't build there. If it's purple, it means that you cannot build a depot there. Okay, so you can't build a resource depot within three tiles of any resource. So I have uh, colored all of the tiles within three tiles of a resource to be purple to show you that. The red location is a starting location. So that's where your initial nexus is placed. Okay. A teal tile is a mineral tile and a green tile is a gas tile. So underneath, inside StarCraft logic, and you start have to, having to think like this when you're programming a bot, is this is how the game is going to look to you. This is like you looking at the matrix, right? Remember when um, Tank was looking at the, the greens, the green symbols and stuff? This is what you have to think um, in terms of when you're programming a StarCraft bot. All right. Um, so I have written into UAlbertaBot some uh, base location parsing and it does some interesting stuff. I'm not going to get into that, but essentially uh, if you don't use any existing library, so there are libraries out there that will do analysis of maps for you and say, okay, here's a choke point, here's a base. Like that stuff is, is something that humans do in their mind and have to write algorithms for. Um, Brood War API will not tell you where a choke point is. It won't tell you where a natural expansion is. You have to figure that out algorithmically. So I actually have a, uh, a GitHub repo called Star Draft, <laughs> which does map analysis and stuff, which you can totally use in your bot if you want to. And I just showed a screenshot of it here. So there's lots of different maps in StarCraft. They all have different properties. They all have um, different starting locations, different number of players, different tile sets, etc. But they all look like this underneath in terms of the logic. So there are map libraries out there. Uh, there's BWTA, which is the Brood War Terrain Analysis uh, Library. Um, there's BWTA2, which is an updated version of that. It's, it's pretty old, though. I wouldn't super recommend it. What I would recommend is the Brood War Easy Map Library. So this is called BWEM. Uh, BWEM community is still being maintained. So if you really want some additional map analysis tools in your bot, please go um, look at BWEM community. It's the one that I recommend. And also uh, Stardraft, which is another system. So this is what BWTA looks like. It's going to take a map and it's going to do some analysis and do some Voronoi diagrams and some interesting stuff and produce uh, regions that you could use for strategy. BWEM does a little bit fancier. Uh, it's going to have like starting bases, bases with assigned resources, um, unwalkable points, choke points, static minerals, all that sort of stuff. Uh, it's all analyzed for you. So you can use that in your bot if you want to. You just have to download their library, include it in your bot and link it, etc. So scouting. We talked about this before. In order to attack your enemy, you need to know where their base is located. Some maps are going to have more than two starting locations. So if you're playing on a two-player map, you know exactly where your enemy is, right? Because there's only two locations, you're in one of them, so they have to be in the other one. If there's more than two locations, you're going to have to go send out scouts. Scouting is usually done with the worker unit after you have made a supply depot. So you can scout whenever you want, but typically when you build a pylon with a Protoss, then you go send that worker to go scout. Or after you've built a spawning pool for the Zerg, then you go send a drone to go scout, etc. So here is just some sample uh, BWAPI code that you could write um, to send out a scout. Now, this is not going to cover all possible um, scenarios, but you could use it as a starting point in your bot to start scouting. 
So here we have um, a function called scout with unit. So we have chosen some unit, a worker, for example, in order to scout with. So here we're just going to check first um, if not scout, which means it's not a if it's a null pointer, we don't want to, you know, if we couldn't find a valid scout, then we don't want to scout with it. So what we're going to do is we're going to send this scout to the base locations on the map in order to find our opponent. So what we're going to do is we're going to um, loop over each of the starting locations. So if it's a two-player map, there's only two of them. If it's a four-player map, then there will be four of them. And starting locations are measured at the build tile or tile position resolution. So what we can do, let's think about this logically. How would we know where to send our scout? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to look at each of the starting locations on the map. And if it is not explored yet, we're going to send our scout there. So Bwapi Brood War has a function called is explored. And what that means is I have seen that tile at some point during this game. It doesn't mean it's currently visible. So there's two functions. One is is visible, meaning can you currently see that tile? Another one is is explored, meaning have I ever seen that tile? So if not is explored, so if we haven't explored that tile before, we're going to convert the tile, which is a tile position, into a Bwapi position, which is the pixel-based position, by just using the constructor of Bwapi position with the tile. Um, then what we're going to do is we're going to get the command of the scout. So we can get a Bwapi, brood, a Bwapi com, uh, unit command object, which is the last command of the scout. And why I'm doing this is because in StarCraft Brood War, there's a really annoying thing. If you keep issuing the same command to the same unit every frame of the game, it could bug out and not move at all. So what we're going to say is that if this unit has already been told to go to this position, don't do anything. So I'm going to say if the, if the scout's current target position is the position we want it to go to, we don't need to do anything else. Just return. It's already going to an unexplored area of the map for a starting position, so we don't need to do anything else. Otherwise, so if this is true, it will return, so I don't need an else. So this is kind of like else, tell the scout to move to that position. That's it. And then we don't want to keep going through all the base locations because we are currently going to that base location, right? So what I'm doing here is I'm just iterating through the base locations in the order that they've given to us. And then if we have explored all the start locations, then we just tell our scout to move back home. And how do we get our home position? Well, we can get Bwapi Brood War Self. That's the player pointer to our player. And we can get our player's start location, convert that to a Bwapi position, and then tell that scout to move back home. Okay? So that is some very basic scouting. Now, what this will do is it will scout every location on the map, every starting location on the map. If you don't want it to do that, let's say um, if you found the enemy base, you wanted to come home and not explore everything else, then you would have to put that logic on top of this yourself. Okay? Um, okay, uh, let me, I gotta pause for one second here. Okay, so that is scouting with units. And really quickly, I wanted to talk to you about why combat is so hard. It's not just as easy as attacking uh, units. StarCraft combat is a very difficult problem for AI to solve. Um, your goal in StarCraft is to kill the enemy units, right? Like they have units, you have units, you're going to do battle. And so there are advanced tactics such as flankings, surround, kiting, etc. They are usually kind of difficult to implement. Um, what I have found in my experience of 10 years of bot programming, start out with attacking the closest enemy unit, okay? So for example... If you are trying to be clever and attack like a worker unit rather than a marine unit, your 
unit may get stuck on the way to kill that worker or something. And so please, at the very beginning of your bot development career, just tell your attackers to attack the closest thing to them. And that is surprisingly hard to do. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, if you are interested in learning what the overall flow of a bot might look like, I recommend going to this link. And again, the, the link to this presentation is going to be in the comments. Um, this tells you the design flow, the overall flow for UAlbertaBot. So let me just open up this link here. And so just as an example, this is what UAlbertaBot, the bot that I wrote, does. It's a hierarchical architecture. But what it does is it's going to go through these steps on every frame of the game. So for example, it's going to manage its workers. It's going to manage its production. It's going to manage its buildings. It's going to manage its combat. It's going to manage its scouting, the information, the map tools that we have, etc. So your bot will have to have some sort of logic flow. So I'll, I, here I've just given you um, an example of what you know a fully fledged bot might do, but other bots have vastly different architectures than mine. And so this is not the only way to do something like that. All right, so once again, what I will do is I will end this off if I can find, um, here we go. So let's just bring up StartCraft again. So StartCraft, um, if you're just getting started with programming, I recommend this bot because it has like self-documenting code. It has much of the code that we went over today in these slides about and starting a bot and, and how to use it. Um, I will show you how easy it is to use right now. Uh, all you have to do, so once you extract StartCraft, um, I know the text is a little bit small. Sorry about that. My resolution is large on this monitor. Um, you are going to click on Windows and it comes with an exe already and it comes with a batch file which does a lot of things for you you can just click on run c++ and uh sorry run c++ bot and starcraft you click on this there's no need for chaos launcher there's no need for anything it will launch it for you and if you go into the bwapi settings and enable the auto menu it will launch everything for you and and it's it's really easy to use uh, it comes with a visual studio project uh, which i have open down here so startcraft it comes with like a main file which sets it up there's a starter bot class which has all of this stuff implemented for you uh, it has some map tools which draw things on the map etc uh, i want to show you one of these things that it does first so let me go back into um it also comes with starcraft I'm just going to edit the BWAPI settings so that it um, does the auto menu for us. All right. So now I'm going to run the bot and StarCraft. It will run the bot. So now this is running the bot. The starter bot by default, it's going to make a bunch of workers and it's going to build some pylons. That's all it does. But it does come with some map analysis tools. So if I type slash map into a message, it will display that grid on the map for us so we can see where we can build we can do all this so if you go into the code of the map tools it will actually all the code for that and how to draw on the screen how to issue commands to the bot that's all there in the starter bot and here i am i am dying to a uh, zerg rush that the computer <laughs> just did so the starter bot does not defend itself but it's a good place to get started. Okay, so I'm just going to let the uh, the game finish. There we go. So we were eliminated, and now Bwapi will start a new game and we'll die all over again. We close it, and that's it. So I can go... I'm going to go more into um, the starter bot programming in the next lecture, but uh, for now, I think that's a good place to end it. And uh, I do highly recommend using StarterBot if you if you want to get uh, to get started with that. All right, thank you very much for tuning in, and uh, I will see you on Thursday.